In 2006, I was a student at Asbury Theological Seminary. Seminary is essentially graduate school for pastors, and so it was honestly a really special time in my life because at every waking moment, I was surrounded by other men and women who were pursuing God's call on their life to go into ministry. We uh, had opportunity uh, on campus to be in class together, to eat together, to wrestle with big questions about who God is and what God is doing together. But we were also kind of competitive. We were so competitive, in fact, that we had our own intramural basketball league. And so at the beginning of the year, we would draft teams and we would have a full-on regular season and then a full-on playoff. And the playoffs, like even though on both teams were men and women who were going to become pastors, like it was pretty competitive. I'll, I'll leave it at that. But one particular game, one particular game was going back and forth. This team would score and then that team would score. And I remember watching friends on both teams as the, as the clock ran out, the tension began to rise and there was less laughing together and more intense competition. Up until this moment, with 10 seconds left, the score tied. One team takes the ball in, and as the clock ticked down, they ran a play as best as future pastors could do. And they shot the ball, and they missed. My friend Isaac, who is a pastor, a senior pastor in Tennessee, did the most athletic thing I ever saw Isaac do up to that point or after that point. And in one fluid motion, as though he were a member of the Utah Jazz, Isaac leaps up, snatches the rebound out of the sky, and puts it back up, banking it off of the backboard and into the net. And the moment the ball goes through the net, we hear the clock buzz. The game is over. And Isaac begins to celebrate. But shortly after the celebration, in fact, like one or two seconds later, Isaac realizes that he was playing defense. And his shot, however awesome it looked, when it went through, it was two points for the other team. Isaac, in this stressful, this high stress, this intense moment, he makes a choice to not just rebound it, but to put the ball back up, and it goes in. And shortly after that, Isaac recognized that he made the wrong choice. Scripture is full of extraordinary moments. It's the story of the intersection between God and people. And at the intersection, the choices that people make, the commitments that people make. My friend Isaac, at that moment, had a choice to make. And here in these pages, over and over again, as God's story intersects with their story, they also have choices to make. They have commitments to decide. And what happens in these pages is as we encounter God, as God encounters people, what happens is what we are really committed to becomes so apparent. There's a moment where Jesus is approached by what scripture descri describes as a rich young man. And we can assume because scripture describes him this way, obviously, that he is a man of wealth, that he is a man of means, that he is a man of comfort. And what Jesus says to him is, if you want to follow me, you have to give that up. You, 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 you have to uh, sell everything you have, give it to the poor, and then you can come and follow me. And scripture describes this rich young man as going away sad because he had great wealth. Now, reading between the lines here, what we see is that the rich young man, although he may think he is committed to following Jesus, that he's committed to Christ. In reality, he is more committed to comfort. He doesn't want to give up his wealth. He doesn't want to give up his means. And frequently, what happens when God's story 
intersects with ours, when God's story intersects with these men and women, they also have a similar choice to make. They have to make a similar commitment. There's a moment where God speaks to Moses through a burning bush, and at that moment, Moses has a choice to make. When God speaks to Noah, Noah has a choice to make. When God speaks to Abraham, Abraham has a choice to make. When God speaks to Mary, Mary has a choice to make. At the intersection of what God is doing and what we are doing, there is always a choice that we have to make. There's always a choice. Now, throughout Scripture, what I love about Scripture is that Scripture is, in a lot of ways, the story of those choices, the story of those commitments. We, we see where Moses' Moses' choice ends up. We see where Abraham's choice ends up. We see where Mary's choice ends up. And then we are sort of brought in to make our own choice. And what I also love about Scripture is that it treats human beings like human beings. Men and women who don't always get it right, who frequently get it wrong, And rather than God saying, hey, you got it wrong, you chose wrong, you you made a basket on the wrong goal, I'm done. That's not what God says. Instead, God continues to extend the invitation. God continues to intersect in our lives, and God continues to invite us to commitment. There's a moment... Um, at the end of the Gospel of John, where all of this, this, this huge intersection happens. This is the moment where the resurrected Jesus appears to Peter. Now, what you must understand is all of the baggage that comes to this particular intersection, all of the, uh, all of the struggle that Peter would have brought to this, because this is the moment where Peter encounters his friend whom he betrayed. So to set the stage, Peter and Jesus, uh, Peter has been right next to Jesus, his right-hand man throughout Jesus' ministry. And then when Jesus is arrested, Scripture tells us that Peter flees. He runs away. He, He chooses to run away, revealing that his commitment is less to Christ and more to comfort. And then that choice is reinforced again. That commitment is revealed again when he is approached and recognized as a friend of Jesus. He says, no, that's not me. That's not me. Not once, not twice, but three times. So the sum total is that Peter has chosen incorrectly four times that Peter has revealed that his commitment is less to Christ and more to comfort four separate times. And at any one of those times, at any one of those times, maybe we would have assumed that God would have said, okay, well, you're done. I gave you a choice and you chose wrong. But that's not God. God's extraordinary forgiveness, forgiveness offers us a future. God's extraordinary forgiveness offers us a future. Hear this story. This is at the end of John, and this is um, one of my favorite stories in, in Scripture. This is John chapter 21, beginning in verse 15, after Jesus and Peter have reconnected And now they're having this conversation. This is verse 15. When they had finished eating, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me more than these? And in this moment, Jesus is welcoming Peter once again to the intersection, welcoming Peter once again to make a choice, welcoming Peter once again to reveal his commitment. Yes, Lord, he said. You know that I love you. Jesus responds, feed my lambs. Again, Jesus said, Simon, son of John, do you truly love me? He answered, yes, Lord, you know that I love you. Jesus said, take care of my sheep. 
Jesus once again is giving Peter a choice and inviting him into commitment. A third time, verse 17, the third time he said to him, Simon, son of John, do you love me? Peter was hurt because Jesus asked him the third time, do you love me? He said, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. And Jesus says, feed my sheep. At this intersection, Jesus gives Peter opportunity to redeem the rejection, to say not once, not twice, but three times, I choose you. Not once, not twice, but three times, I commit to you. And then Jesus describes what that commitment looks like. It's not a passive commitment. It's not a commitment to comfort. It is a commitment to calling, a calling that is uh, made manifest, that a calling that comes to life as we love God and as we love our neighbor. I sense that 2021 is, is a crossroads, that we find ourselves at a crossroads, and just like every other crossroads, a choice is required. And so, my friends, I hope that you, in 2021, as you stand at the crossroads together, that despite every temptation to choose comfort, that you will choose calling, that you will choose to love sacrificially, that you will choose to recommit to God. And in that recommitment to loving God, that you would also love your neighbor. This is the commitment that will make 2021 extraordinary. And let's go a step beyond that. Not just 2021, but your whole life. 